Today on Public Research with Daniel Schwartz. Researcher Carl Folk of the Institute of Unreality discusses the billionaire-funded neo-reactionary movement and the Nazification of the Gen Z right. You know, it's so funny. I'm looking at your, web your website. Unreal, living in the post-truth world. Speaking of the devil, there's a tidal wave about 300 <laughs> feet tall. It's about to hit humanity that's online. And most uh, I, people have no idea. There's nothing. Yeah. I mean, I just, I. it's one of the most interesting things to me as a sociologist and as someone who is just a people observer and has been my entire life. Like, this is something people aren't ready for. Um, you're, that Urkel AI is one of the scariest things you, anyone's ever seen. And, it, you know, I couldn't parse that if I didn't know. You oh. know, like, that's something that's it's, it's, it's spot on. And, you know, that's a concern as someone who, in a past life, was a musician and a, a touring musician, like, this stuff is going to be amazing for certain things and absolutely the scariest thing you've ever seen on the other end. Oh yeah. And you know, I do have my, <laughs> my worries about that. Cause we're, we're just not ready. None of us, even those of us who watch it all the time and are academically involved, it's not possible to be able to spot everything. And especially like that deep fake voice stuff. There's nothing you can do. Do you know the NPR show uh, by any chance on being with Krista Tippett? I like, feel like it's where the sweaty balls skit yeah. for SNL came from, right? Like, exactly. exactly. So I took her voice and I just said, Today on On Being, we talked to Young Thug about his work and it and it sounds totally real. And I could put a video on YouTube with her logo. And so the the I mean, the stuff that is going to happen, people can't even imagine. People are just like, think about, you know, the cliche of the crazy X. Just think oh, about yeah. the crazy X. They're going to take the, the X's voice and put up videos of them saying the N word. You're hiring this guy. He's saying this. I mean, so I, or, or, or people are going to stir up fake controversies. Look at what this person just said about you. Oh, you don't believe me? Here's the audio of them calling you X. Absolutely. I mean, the era of the deep fake, right? None of us, none of us are ready for this. And we're already seeing it with scam phone calls <clears throat> that are emulating oh my God. relatives' voices to ask for money. You know, like, and that's a I known thing that's you. gone on, you know, where people spoof a cell phone call. That already, that's old tech. But then you add in the fake voice of a child or a niece or a nephew asking for money and here's the bank account. Oh, yeah. I am I just got arrested in Amsterdam. Listen, they're going to cut me off the phone. I have to go. You have to exactly. wire it right away to this account. Exactly. I, you have to. And then the, and somebody has Alzheimer's. I was, people were talking about this theoretically like a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. And now it's happening. And it's oh, and it's, and it's happening pretty, pretty broadly, right? Like this is one of the ones we see. And it's, you know, these are just kind of edge of the map uses of this so far in specific regards to, you know, engineering social movements, right? Like we're going to start to see stuff that is so out of, you know, the box that is there i already know what's gonna happen i mean well the but, on Bitchu, I, they have emma watson reading mein kampf by the way well, there's i mean that's exactly that's the kind but, of stuff I'm but they're about. also going to do like fake jewish voices saying yeah we kill the kids to put well there's a, there's a lot of really there's gonna be an influx of stuff that you just don't know whether it is or isn't if it's if it's some weird hybrid amalgamation of ai and real I mean, the deep fake stuff is really a threat, you know, but it's it, it's part that's one part of a broader effort. Right. And like that broader effort isn't as hypothetical as some of the other stuff that we're seeing with tech. Right. <clears throat> and, you know, you don't have to have anything as high tech as these voice generators or any of that to really do damage. And, you know, I, on Monday of last week, I put out this article about the new right and kind of their goals. And that's one of the ways, 
you know, the, the AI generative voice tech is part of a trend within the Silicon Valley new world and the new movement kind of, of the new tech uh, billionaire class has a very different view of what society should look like. You know, so we're dealing with people who want to disrupt society at a pretty fundamental understanding of reality level. And that's, you know, their their own words. <laughs> no, so let's just lay out the you. Why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm Carl Folk. I'm from Minneapolis, um, activist turned nerd and uh, researcher on the, the far the, the far right and kind of more. You know, I came from the background of searching misinformation and disinformation in Russia um, and kind of the the creation of Putin and the new Russian state um, and their their media model and their political model um, and the intersection of those. And I moved from there into more because of Russia's composition, let's say, of far right thinking, specifically around multipolar politics and, and what we would consider super hard right, um, alt right kind of thought processes. Um, you get into some of the weirder sides of American new right, fascist, Nazi uh, propaganda and stuff, because it's all pulling from the same well. And so, you know, that turned into where we are now and more my interest on how the right weaponizes niche cognitive techniques to really game politics but also our sense of reason and uh, can you give an example of that of gaming on reason and reason yeah 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 well look at i mean look at any of the current um right-wing news cycles right they're really they look at something like the hunt and hunter biden story or other you know stories that have been built by their own media machine and influencer machine in the internet world and it goes back and forth between you know corporate media quote unquote and their internet sphere and it's a b testing certain things narratives decision where you know decisions on how to to word things and it plays back and forth and creates this you know i think it's been called the reality distortion field right like that that just it's a different world inside that bubble. And for that to exist when it's trying to win the quote culture, war, it has to push everything else out of its way. And to do that in a society as large and kind of as robust as our democracy is as problematic as it is and as many issues right, as it right. has, it can push those things out of the way just by nothing's real. Anything's possible. There's a there's zero ability to find truth, and it doesn't matter what the truth is ultimately in their propaganda vision, because the truth shifts every time they need it to. Did you yeah. notice? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no continue. What, Did what, you what? notice that when they um, when Bannon and Guo, who's a, a mystery himself, you know, half the people say he hates the Chinese government. Half half of the people say works for it did you see when they did the hunter biden dump during the election they it was very clever what they did they interspersed um a photo of malia oh which is real but it's from years ago of malia obama's credit card with coke on it and the, and they put it next to a uh, light-skinned african-american girl's the side of her to imply hunter biden was doing coke having sex with malia obama is very well, I mean, clever i mean that's so you know a lot of the countering disinfo world talks about truth sandwiches right where you take the truth and sandwich other things around it the inverse of that is a bullshit sandwich, and that's a great way to package it right like is to take real a real image a shit story bring them together and in the right the 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 population already knows what that 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 signals right so there's a lot of signaling then that comes from that to different groups and like the the unfortunate genius of the republicans right now is that they've understood that unreality untruth unreason 
is incredibly easy to spread and convince people of because you don't have to, there is no reason. It's all the story, right? So the story becomes the, the thing that they're really involved with as the group. Let me play devil's advocate just for the viewers' yeah. entertainment. Uh, well, wh what do you mean on reality? I mean, Hunter Biden smokes crack. That's reality. Ab absolutely. No, 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 no. So reality is the thing that that story is feeding. It's not necessarily that one thing, right? So, like, yeah, Hunter Biden has had problems with drugs. We, this is a known commodity in politics and has been for a while. It's the larger thing that that is then being fed into, right? This this thing I already talked about in, in part, the, the the jump from the internet to their corporate media, right-wing corporate media, whether that's OAN, whether that's Newsmax, whether that's Fox, and then going back to the internet and then back and forth and back and forth. And the, and the base user, then, right, is the one that's caught in the middle of that. And so there, it's a constant reinforcement mechanism for that. And that, that then becomes the truth, right? Like for the people inside that bubble, that story becomes the truth. And that's the unreality of it, right? The unreality isn't necessarily the story about the stories about Hunter Biden, because he has his, his substance abuse issues, he has his other issues. But it's the larger machinery that that then is feeding and then that gives it a little bit more credibility, right? Like that is an honest story. I, mean, um, I would point to, I think what you're saying is true. The Hunter thing, because like he has admitted to smoking crack. and Absolutely. And stuff, yeah. That one, that one, but I'll give you a perfect example to bolster your point. Do you remember when Marjorie Taylor Greene was giving like official co congressional press conferences and she just was claiming as a fact that Ukraine was money laundering the uh, FTX money. Yeah, I mean any of her claims. This is right? a fact. Yeah. Well, right, and and she does. She's one of a few that do that a lot. Where it's this is the truth, and there's no alternative, and it's a part of the same thing, right? Like it, it, in the two seconds on on the internet news or on you know some thread where someone sees something, that's the thing they see. And that just reinforces the whole story that they've seen. I mean, if anybody doubts this, but, and if anybody's saying, well, you're just talking about the fringe, it's not, it's not the really the, you know, it's not Republican senators, surely. Well, I got news for you. Uh, Mike Lee just tweeted out an InfoWars article. Today. Oh, yeah, no, he, he is on one today. Um, and, you know, we're talking about a guy whose account is based Mike Lee, right? So, like, Anyone who knows, knows what this dude is. And, you know, I think it's hard for people, right? Like, they want to point and say, this is one thing. This is one group. This is one element. And it's not, right? Like, it's a large pan right group that is a hybrid, you know, ideology amongst all of them that has an over, a bunch of overlapping goals and, and beliefs. And so, like, a guy like Mike Lee, you know people want to pin him down and they can't so it makes it really hard to counter that kind of stuff he puts up online so you have a site or you have an institute i think this is such a good uh, title institute of unreality mm -hmm. which i think as we talked about with the deep fakes is going to become increasingly that's this is going to be a word we're going to be using a lot in the future and you write in this article you put out, America's New Right, Dreams of Electric Sheep by Carl Folk. You write, no analysis of the American right in Silicon Valley would be complete without at least touching on the PayPal mafia. Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, and Mark Andreessen. And I'll tell you what, Carl, I wonder if you see this. When I go to even small Nazi accounts on Twitter, small ones yep i'll tell you what i i, I see and i'm not gonna say 100 percent of the time but i'll say i don't know 30 40 percent of the time followed by mark andreessen the conehead <laughs> the billionaire conehead <laughs> and it's just the funny it's the weirdest thing there's been so many negative articles about peer too 
Okay. Mm hmm. So many. Mark Andreessen, is he richer in Peter Thiel? The guy is openly following Paul Kostner's E. Michael Jones on Twitter. I mean, and then he's talking about accelerationism. And yet, I would estimate maybe. 1% of the negative articles that Teal gets? I don't understand why nobody... Are people just scared of this guy? This Conan? Well, I think I think he's flown under the radar in a pretty significant way, in probably the same way that Musk has, where you know, there are a lot of pretty solid alleged incidents of him buying off good press, right? And that's Musk. And I think that that, you know, you look at that, and you've got to assume some of these other guys who are in the same position monetarily or nearly, you know, who have a similar new right belief and neo reactionary belief that, you know, that, that, that excel. I mean, these guys are all Nick Land, Dark Enlightenment, Nick Bostrom guys who are true hardcore neo reactionaries. You know, one of the first things I read years ago coming from the misinformation in Russia side was about the neo-reactionary monarchist movement here and their ties to that deep, uh, the esoteric side of Russian fascism, right? And so these guys are all kind of in the same nest of Evola stew. And it's, it's deeply, I mean, these guys are, and Dreesen, you know, I mean, these guys are accelerationists in the term like the, the the nick land nick bostrom sense these guys are tech accelerationists who see disruption not in the sense of tech disruption but system disruption and that's a different whole thing they want to bring about a whole different world you know we're talking something that is they've described it as capitalism sharpened to a fascist edge they've said this publicly like this is a goal of for that neo-reactionary movement that that he and others are a part of within the new Silicon Valley movement, you know, and, and Musk and Andreessen and I mean Richard Sachs, these are all guys uh, who David Sachs or David Sachs. Did I say Richard David? Yeah, right. David David Sachs, you know, and I mean these guys. David isn't as openly rough as in, as Mark, but you know these guys are pretty clear in what their intention goals and desires i mean we'll we'll get into that i mean we need to because you know i'm a i'm a nerd on this stuff like you but i don't even know nick Land. i've heard the name nick land but I, I, the dark and light yeah, we we for audience people we have to explain some of these names so uh, yeah, no, I, julius I, evola was this uh italian fascist guy he was in a wheelchair or something he wrote these books with these titles like well, by the way there's nothing wrong with being in a wheelchair at all it's not about that but the guy was writing these books called ride the tiger and so it's just ironic he's one of those deep esoteric fascists and like you know i think he there is some consensus that people think of not consensus there's a lot of thought that would say that he is more fascist than like even the nazi parties were and the you know the, the this guy is deeply into some stuff that is heavier than a lot of the, the nazi ideology we understand right like he's he was there's a progression yeah, i you know i try to be careful i don't call i mean i could i think there's a really strong case you could call uh, Elon Musk and anti-Semite. I don't do it just because, look, I mean, he, he, it, it's just a fact. He posts positive comments on neo-Nazis tweets like Keith Woods, the Irish neo-Nazis. Okay. Absolutely. Well, and, but, he, and he posts but, stuff that is openly yeah. from... Oh, yeah. He said, from, you know, George Soros hates humanity. Oh, you oh. can make a totally strong case to call him The reason with him and even Andreessen that I, I I hesitate slapping that label on is because I know that they're going to come back with, oh yeah, okay, I'm Mark Andreessen. Yeah, what's the name of my venture capital firm, dumbass? And he's going to be like, it's Andreessen Horowitz. What? Who's Horowitz? My partner what? is a Jewish guy. They have a lot of Jewish friends. So I've always assumed 
the PayPal mafia, those far right guys, they were, they're not Nick Fuentes, Groyper, for, they're not like throwing up the Nazi salute in public. They're like, they're a different type of far right animal. Well, this it's is the new cool. right, right? Like, yeah. I think this is the American new right, which I think we can classify as kind of the outgrowth of the collapse of the alt-right in America in the last couple years. And this is much more tech-focused, much more post-rationalist, much more techno-fascist, right? Like, this is the long-termers, the test real movement guys, right? So this is a different kind of fascism necessarily than the, um, yeah, the Nick Fuentes extremely hardcore, you know, troll level open anti-semitism i think you know one of one of the pieces that helped me kind of understand all of this better a few years ago when i first started really reading in to this specific part of the network within the transnational fascist movement that this is a part of is a part by tamir baran uh called the french new rights quest for alternative modernity and it really outlines a good, I mean, a very well articulated understanding of the new, like the French New Right, right their philosophy that turned into what we understand as kind of the American alt right. And then I, I think it also shows a very good roadmap of what the new the new right is, where it's a combination of the alt, some alt right elements, a lot of them, especially core beliefs. But then also it has this very neo-reactionary element that's more uh, based on the accelerationism out of Nick Land and the, the dark enlightenment ideals he put forth, um, like what, 20 years ago now? I mean, a long time ago. So this, um, this is, I think this is a good conversation to be having about this. Like, oh yeah. It's, it's, it's a huge conversation though, too. And that's one of the problems like with that article that I put up. That's 2,500 words. It's dense, but it it um, it only covers a sliver of the thing that this is. And, you know, I kind of phrased it in a way where I'm going to be doing more in-depth pieces that bring more and more to light because there's a lot here, especially with the, the, the Andreessen, Thiel, Musk uh, world that, that's growing there. I love that you're doing maps and I think that's the way to go. Um, it's the only way my brain works for this. Yeah. I can't. I can't keep like, you know, I can't keep like a sheet of paper like this in my head. Right. But I, me too. I take info from that right. and put it into something that's much more visual for me. Right. And um, it's been really interesting seeing how many people really like that, and and how useful it is for other researchers even to glance at it and say, oh, this is a connection. So how what? did this? Wh where did this come from? And then you can zoom in, look at it, and really start to understand that, oh, this person funded this person for 25 years, or this person yeah. and this person wrote together for a number of years on an obscure blog. Or and once you start putting the billionaires into the mix, you just see the tentacle. I mean, listen, and by the way, of course, like some of these these words can be problematic and you know, tent tentacles, and, you know, I get, I get I get it. But literally, like, look at Harlan Crow and how many people the guy is funding. I, this is the map and it's a pretty dense map. I've been working on it for three years now. But so if you look at here, you know, so we can look, let's see. I'll go in on Richard Penina here. So he was just outed uh, in the general public, at least, as being, you know, an alt-right, deeply racist, anti-Semitic. Right? I have a story about him for later, but keep going. Yeah. <laughs> I, I will be very interested to hear this. Um, so if we look here, you know, so he's in Turkey. And the map moves from him, I mean, to everything from the Heritage Foundation and the Cato Institute to, you know, the, the Manhattan Institute and guys like Mark Andreessen and, and you know. Uh, Harlan Crow. Yeah, Harlan Crow. Some, some big names in the right. But then his Center for the Study of, the, of Partisanship and Ideology at, at uh, Austin, that has links 
again, to even, you know, even more to the Manhattan Institute, even more to things like the Claremont Institute, to, to Chris Rufo, um, things like City Journal, which is the Manhattan Institute's um, public publication. But then, you know, one step further, they all have ties to guys like Ron DeSantis, Tom Cotton, the Koch brothers, you know. And it, it just, it's a, it's a very dense web of different groups, foundations, institutions that are tied to colleges and universities, and then these extremely hard right individuals. Is Inez Stepman in this? Not yet. Um, okay. These maps are constantly being yeah, that's, updated. That's he and I don't even know how to say his name. And I don't know how to spell it. Well, he did a podcast with the goofy, that's the nice thing I'll say about <laughs> Michael Tracy for a while, called uh, Gathering of Experts. Okay. Um, and But now he and his new podcast is called Clown Car. And he does it with Inez Stepman, who I think is at, she's at some conservative think tank. She's at Independent Women's Forum. They're like the people who go to bat for like uh, Kavanaugh and stuff like that. And uh, she does a podcast now with him. And so it comes out that he was the, uh, writing for all these, these these Nazi websites. And I mean literally Nazi websites. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, 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 Two of them. Two of them. Counter-occurrence, Occidental Observer. Well, in those two, I mean Occidental is... It's just as like, hard as it comes. Oh, yeah. And if you look at Countercurrents, yeah. his articles were running next to, like, books about how awesome Hitler was. And well, Countercurrents like is, I mean, a Nazi publication. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And and so he was doing it under the pen name Richard Host. So this Christopher Matthias, who's awesome at Huffington Post, through amazing reporting, proves it it's him right right uh, and he does his th first podcast with the nest stepman after this like a week after or something and it's just funny there's like ben I, i'm not sure if anybody else has even reported on this but i've been trying to get people to cover it he like for like one second is like i don't believe that and yeah, i'm sorry this would be bad like one second the rest of the show is just doubling down, tripling down, attacking the people who exposed him. He literally says, both of them say, they, they do this thing, and I posted it on Twitter, about, you know, they're seeing lots of stuff in the world that gives them hope, you know? And they're talking about, you know, the stuff in the world giving them hope. And like, for me and you, it would be like, oh, there was a kid volunteering at the soup kitchen, right? Right. What gives Richard Hyeni and Anna Stepman hope? It gives them hope that Paul Gosar <laughs> hasn't denounced Nazi Nick Fuentes, who he fundraises with. I think we're not that far off from the way that our culture was operating until recently. I'm wondering if you think that that actually is changing, because it seems like Peter, I don't think, is, is like blackballed from the right. You, I don't think, are going to be blackballed from the right. Nate, I don't think it's going to be blackballed from, from the right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's crazier than that. Nate Fu Nick Fuentes is hanging out with, like, congressmen. I mean, you see, like, Paul Gosar was, like, speaking at, like, Nick Fuentes' uh, event or something like that. And I, as far as I know, these congressmen don't denounce them. So I think, I think we really are in the new world. I think the polarization is such that, like, something like Huffington Post has no, uh, you know, has no sort of, you know, credibility to be telling people how they should think about different issues to the right. So, yeah. Right. Well, I mean, so he's still a Nazi. Well, these guys were dealing with, I mean, and that's the thing. The new right, like I said, you know, is kind of this hybrid ideology, right? So, like, you have it ever shifts in front of the camera, but the, the core of it is exactly that. It, it is modern Nazism, right? Like, an, an, and super hard fascism and reactionary kind of thinking. All, you know, all kind of in the same space. And it changes when it needs to. And... Yet, like they're like you know that what they're seeing is exactly what you said. You know, they're seeing the the light they're seeing is that their ideas are being hyper normalized, are being accepted as things that are going to be okay. The UN is you know working with some of these same people to look into long termism, right? Like these are extremely problematic trends that they are now directly a part. 
And with long-termism, like thinking that out, these are, you know, really kind of dangerous ideas that are now permeating some of the legal bodies that do destine our future in certain parts of the world. And that's concern, especially what that means for parts of the world that they have pretty explicitly said don't matter. Because at the heart of this is a, a, a deeply eugenics idea of the world, or, you know, eugenicist idea of the world. I gotta play devil's advocate just for the sake of it. So, yeah, is is Andreessen a Nazi? I don't think you could say he's a Nazi outright. I okay. think he is an accelerationist, a tech accelerationist. I think he's a neo-reactionary. Okay. Right. Um, I think he's deeply invested with a large group of people who have a whole host of beliefs that fit into everything from the Nazi milieu to the extremely hard right libertarian milieu, right? right? Like no, I think no. this is okay. a little bit, it's, gotcha. it's kind of a, it's an a la carte far right. Gotcha. Right? Like this isn't- Take what you want. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's a very pick what you want uh, far right, but it all has the same goals ultimately. I want to get into terminology because it can be uh, confusing for people. Yeah, right. So, like, I don't know. The alt-right, like, I, that word, right, to describe what Richard Spencer and these guys were, like Peter Brimlow and all these dudes, um, you know, that was, that came out of the paleo-conservative world and, like, the, the hard liberta hard right libertarian world, right, like in 08. And that was, I think that, I don't remember. Taki magazine, I think. Taki's mag, yep. Yeah. And so, so like, Taki, when, we should tell the audience Taki is referring to this Greek billionaire playboy correct. guy named Taki Thera. I'm sorry, it's a Greek last name. Yeah. It's, or something. it's, a, it's quite hard. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. I cut you off. Um, no, but so, like, you know, and that was a couple of years be before altright.com. And then, like, but those guys, like, that was Brimlow. And then, you know, one and of their... Spencer was the editor of Talkies Mag before he made his... Yep, office. exactly. And, you know, Paul Gottfried, these guys, those were all over there, but they were doing exactly the thing that has accelerated now within the, the Silicon Valley movement, which is mixing this Evola fascism, you know, kind of European New Right ideas at the time. I, it just extremely large milieu of extremely fascist and hard right ideologies kind of percolating around. And it's what we're seeing again in this tech movement. Um, it's the same, it's similar people. Again, it's all, you know, kind of downstream from the alt right. See, I know that Teal met with James Kirkpatrick. That's yeah. a pen name. What's his yep. real name? I, I can't remember his real name, but I know and, who you're talking about. And it's interesting. I think distinctions are very important, just to be honest. Like, I saw people, like, grouping, like, V-Day or Occidental Observer and Countercurrents, and I sort of cringed. Though it's not, like, a huge... It's not like they're totally distinct. It's not like V-Day is like, oh, they're like the New York Times. No. But... Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know what V is like now, but I know that they were like not openly anti-Semitic for a while. I don't know if they are now. Well, like the, the big difference, right, between like the American right and the European right for a long time was the level of anti-Semitism. Right. And the American side, for whatever reason in the interwar period... Um, was it deeply anti-Semitic? Don't get me wrong; it horrifyingly so. But it, it, the the European right has a very different view of it, and like the alt right and them weren't explicitly anti-Semitic outwardly. Um, in, in the start, in the start. correct in, in the very start, and this is almost twenty years ago, right? So, and like it, it, you know, the alt right and its white nationalist kind of milieu, right? Like. I don't know. There's just so many parts of it. Like you can, there's so much of the manosphere that's a part of it and what that means about, you know, like uh, it, it, patriarchy and how, how it's working within our current level of understanding. 
you know, and then that ties with the monarchist and hierarchical views that bleed into neo-reactionary politics, like the ones that, you know, we see kind of with the, the Mark Andreessen and those guys, that crowd. So this is really interesting because, like, we are very simpatico, like, we both understand, like, there's something really nasty afoot in this country, and I think we totally agree on that. But you have this set of knowledge about this sphere of uh, neo-reactionaries and Nick Land that I am really ignorant about. And, mm-hmm. then, and my focus is ju- is mostly on like Gen Z, the Fuentes, right. Nazis, yeah. uh, and so it, it's it's the it's, new crop of kids. It, it's quite interesting. Um, but this term "new right," I guess my problem with this it hasn't been used like a thousand times in the past, so it gets like really confusing because like they were talking about a new right in the eighties and the nineties and. The, well, I think it's tough, right? Because the, the 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 new right is a set of ideologies, right? In Europe specifically. And the alt-right, what I, I really look at was a very specific time span between like 08 and 18, 19. And, you know, I, th- I think they've morphed into something a little bit more aggressive and a little bit more towards what, you know, you see their original views within like what they draw from the French new right and Benoit and that like they, they, they definitely always have had that ideology. It's always been a part of it, but it seems they've kind of, again, um, reinvented certain parts of the movement to better reflect some of that thinking. And You know, that's where we get this idea of infrastructure building and alternative building, uh, like building think tanks and all these different things that give credence and in our society specifically, give an air of expertise on subjects that they may not be a part of. Okay, so I'm a very specific person. Like, that's the way I need to understand. Absolutely. So let me just, just so... I and the audience can better understand the contours mm-hmm. here. I'll just name people and you tell them. So are the Groypers part of the new right? I would consider, I mean, the, 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 the new right I look at as a pan ideological right wing movement of similarly motivated and uh, groups and individuals that have a similar goal of ending democracy for a white ethno state in different flavors well let me just put it this way who on the right would not it could be a columnist senator a congressman i assume liz cheney is not part of the new right. absolutely not i mean okay. i i think there are a number of people who i think live in the right at the edge of the silo that exists online and like in media who? port I think a good example is someone like a Kinzinger because he, his age, his military background, all these things, he's existed in the world that the alt-right has kind of built over the last, from 2008 until 18 or 19, right? But for whatever reason, call it Patriot, whatever reason, I don't know what the reason is and I won't ascribe one to him. He didn't fall into the trap that so many of these people do of the false kind of negative that their re- reality requires, right? I mean, another good example um, at like a state level even would be, you know, some of the southern states like Tennessee and whatnot, they have coalitions strange coalitions growing between democrats some liberal not some not as liberal and more moderate uh members of the conservative party i think you see much more of the state level kind of right at the edge of the thing but not in it and i think it's because the thing that works at the national level for these the mtgs the 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 mike lees doesn't work necessarily in certain states where there's still um, some balance in the politics. So I think I've done I've I've done a disservice. You've written this really big article. You put a lot of work into. 
but I just want to give you the floor. Yeah, I, I wrote this article. It's called uh, Do, uh, The Alt-Right Dreams of Electric Sheep, or The American New Right, excuse me, Dreams of uh, Electric Sheep. And we, you know, for me and a lot of people in the far right, I think there's a growing sense that... Just to be clear, Carl's not in the far right. Just I am know. not. <laughs> in, in fact, I am opposed to all of it in a pretty vehement way if you ever... Uh, Tr trust me. I can vouch for that. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it's one of those things, you know, this is, I think, a very important thing. And the the American right has laid out kind of its plans, both at the Republic, you know, kind of the joke, you know, for a lot of my late teens and early 20s was, you know, the, the Republicans have told us what they're going to do. We just have to wait and watch. And it's the same thing with these groups. And they've, you know, there's a whole host of research from Matthew Lyons' wonderful Control Alt Delete, or you know, um, uh, the, the article I talked about earlier from uh, Tamir Bar on. You know, these are great things that inform that article. And really, you know, we're dealing with a group now that looks like every group it wants to emulate and even if that means it's a political group and you know one of the things the alt-right always the claim was this button-down fascism and i think that's fair um but it's also the tech bro fascism it's also the fuentes style um super aggressive trolly internet show shows but right now we're specifically seeing it and what the article is about is seeing it in Silicon Valley and how it's being manifest through our understanding of technology and the kind of ongoing acceleration towards a future that is entirely anti-social in a pretty fundamental way based on these technologies. And, you know, the article really goes more in depth on the heart of the alt what was once the alt-right and what I believe is now the American new right. And, you know, it shows the merger of Silicon Valley and its new money with this new and extremely unsettling and deeply fascist view of the world and what they are trying to world build. And we're facing something that's different, but entirely the same as some of the past iterations of far-right, neo-fascist, and Nazi ideologies, you know, it's utilizing technology at its, its kind of cutting edge to try and undermine the collective reality of society in a pretty fundamental way, um, both to forward its own interests, but to devalue the interests of those it sees as a problem that needs to be dominated and get, get gotten rid of. And I think that, you know, it, those things are starting to come together, not just for researchers who've been seeing this and yelling about it for a long time years but also you know the general public starting to get wind of some of this the pronatalism the long-termism all these different things people generally see it and laugh at the absurdity of it but also fail to understand you know there's a whole lot of power and money behind some of this i i think what you know whether people sign on to 100 percent of your conception or not, people can quibble with definitions and stuff, right? That's absolutely. All fine. But one thing that is absolutely true that you're getting at here is one of the few upsides, I guess you could say, there's way more downsides to Musk, uh, <laughs> his horrible Twitter ownership. One of the few upsides is that I think slowly this, this um, myth that Silicon Valley is just all liberals is dying away, which is, look, I mean, the workers, I guess, like the coders, they might be liberal, okay? But the bosses, some of them are liberal, but as you point out, the, the, this PayPal mafia, Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, Mark Andreessen, David Sachs, they are very, very far from liberal. Very fun. Absolutely. I mean, they're reactionary in a pretty fundamental way. And they view, you know, we're, we're talking like techno fiefdoms, right? And digital nation states. And and it just says 
a lot about the vision of the world they have, you know, and I think it's important for people to understand, like, you know, when you have, let's say, a billion people on your platform and you're worth 50 to 100 billion dollars, you are effectively a nation state. Oh, a hundred? You mean uh, you're talking about Musk? So that that's over a hundred billion dollars. Absolutely, but you're essentially yeah. a digital nation state, right? Be, so, like, yeah. you can do things that we're starting to get at the edges of very weird neo reactionary and and, and uh, monarchist, you know, uh, hierarchical views of how society should be ordered, how they should be protected because they are there's a merit system in place, which just isn't true. And Musk, like you said, has shattered that in probably the you know, one in out of one hundred billion poor choices, he's made one that really did shatter that illusion that because you're a billionaire you're brilliant. Um I mean, let, let's be clear. Okay, so we're, we're going to have to... This is going to be difficult, but we do have to explain this. Because if a freak like me doesn't even know this stuff, the people listening to this, a lot of them are going to be in the dark. So let's talk about... Okay, take... Now, it's funny. Neil Reactionary was the NRX. Yep, um, yep. I, the, the, the guy I heard is... Um, what's his name? Mencius... Moldbug? Mulder. Yeah, what's his yeah. real name again? Curtis Yarvin. Yarvin. Yeah. Yep. yep. And he's got teal funding, and he's. Oh yeah, yeah. Another... These are these are big names in the Texas. And then Nick is Nick Land. Is he a friend of his? I mean, the, so like Nick Land and Bostrom and all these guys, you know, are uh, philosophers who came like Land specifically came out of Warwick and the Cybernetic Research Unit there. Um, along with some other guys. And these were ra rationalist, post-rationalist, kind of in that world as well. And, you know, like they, they reject egalitarianism in principle. They argue for like genetic differences in ability and intelligence and that kind of stuff. Um, they like monarchy. One, one of their... Yes, they're, mon they're, they're, they're monarchy. That, like though, like the Yarvin guy, like he he was on um this pretty mainstream kind of right wing YouTube show, and I I guess the softer side of it that they present to like the normies is like, hey, you know, think about democracy versus monarchy. Yep. Yeah, the dead the president's only there for four years, so if he really screws up, he. But a king, if he's he's there his whole life, if he really screws up. You know, the, the people are going to chop his head off, so he has to be a better leader. He's more invested. That That's sort of the softer stuff, right? Right. Well, and like with Land, right? Like, and his, I mean, he, tech acceleration is, is in part his baby. And his belief really is like to sharpen the edge of capital to, fas to a fascist edge. And it goes further than that, which is like pushing glo global capital to the point where artificial intelligence replaces humans, right? Like it's a transhuman accelerationist idea that he's got. And, you know, like these are the guys that Theo loves and all of that. So, you know, you've got Yarvin and Isimov. These are all Theo guys. And they're, 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 I mean, it is the anti-enlightenment. Like when they say dark enlightenment, it is going back prior to the French Revolution, prior to all of this, to a monarchist right wing, extremely hierarchical, science racism based feudal society. And, you know, it, there's just a lot of tie between that and the alt, alt slash new right. And, you know, and like Sailor and these guys, like they Steve live in. Sailor. Yeah, yeah, Steve Sailor. Um, they live in both worlds, right? Like there are a lot of these guys who originally came from straddling the fence and they're, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, I think in some ways it's about breaking taboos and breaking cultural norms as much as it is anything else. Um, and building from that and, and, you know, with guys who are billionaires like Thiel and that. And but, but these guys are more respectable than your average groiper yelling like gas well they're not you. trolls in the the yeah. sense of being a nazi troll like a, a like a basic groiper right like a, a basic groiper is just some some you know kid and 
you know, that's a different thing than this. Um, this is much more people who understand appearance is everything. And in some cases, like with Musk, are obsessed with it. And they understand that that's some of the power of their, you know, of the movement is to keep it behind that kind of veneer. And it's just, it's a different, it's a different looking version of a thing that we've all, you know, for, for those of us in the right wing research community um, have seen time and time again, which is, you know, a fascist movement that looks like uh, a bank meeting. It's, it's so good to talk to you and compare notes because I'm, I'm really ignorant about a lot of these people and my heuristic or I guess that's a fancy word. My the way I've been thinking mostly about this is generational. Yeah, boomers, I, millennials, Gen Z, and I think my thing where I'm like the conventional wisdom isn't getting right is they people don't understand how radical the Gen Z right is. They just don't the get Gen, it. The Gen Z right are you know are scared. They're not. I mean, half they're not. Them, they're not. I mean, I, I a actually, good amount of them not. 100% okay but it's crazy. Yeah, so, there's a there's enough percentage of guys like the campaign staffer in Florida who just got outed for putting up that Nate Hawkman. Yeah. Who works in the go putting up the running up the hill fast wave video for DeSantis. Like this this crew of the online right in Gen Z um they're fascists. Right, like these these guys are a different thing than the Republican Party has put on its plate before for its future generations. But it may, you know, one of the things that we've seen coming out of Florida and other places, and you see it in in right wing movements outside of the U.S., is they become almost self neutering because of things like that video from Florida and other stuff. If they don't have command of the entire media sphere and the arms of politics at the national level, this stuff alienates people. It's deeply weird. It's deeply unsettling, to, to, to quote normies. And for people who have any understanding of history and certain things, it sets off alarm bells. So, you know, it's interesting seeing what's happened to DeSantis because of that embrace for this extremely hardcore online Gen Z fascist energy. Well, Carl, let's let's be fair. Uh, Nate Hookman uh, told uh, Rod Dreher he had no idea what that symbol was. He, he thought it was an Aztec symbol. Sir, he was celebrating Latino heritage, and here you are calling him a Nazi. He thought it was you know, an Aztec symbol. How how dare how dare he argue in bad faith for overt Nazi symbi symbol symbology? Whoever would have thought the far right would be extremely well versed in that, it's... especially a bunch of Gen Z super online Chan Nazis. I just love the idea that he had, he's like an admitted listener, fan of Nick Fuentes, and he has no idea what that nonsense is. Well, and I mean, there, it's going to be real interesting as more comes out about different states, Republican representatives and their staff, because that seems to be a dead log that just continues to spill rot forth every time someone kicks it. Um, oh, and so it's 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 everywhere in that party their younger branch that is far scarier okay so i've been begging and by the way i want to give a shout out to hunter walker and arizona right wing watch um, hell yeah and because they basically broke this story and josh marshall at tpm because he published the story about which is by the way now, I'm not throwing shade at TPM, but the fact that the New York Times and Yahoo or like some bigger outlet did not like, I wonder if they rejected this story. But anyways, I mean, because it seems like a huge, it should be a huge story. We have admitted members of basically a Nazi cult that have literally r raised their right hand and taken like a Hitler vow to Nick, this like Holocaust denier Nick Fuentes, promising to, what is it, rape, murder, and kill for Nick Fuentes? Raise your right hand 
Repeat after me. I will kill, rape, and die for Nicholas J. Fuentes. This Wade Searle, so Paul Gosar has a long association with this Hitler lover guy named Nick Fuentes. He has two staffers who are still on staff who were exposed, open, they're, they're neo-Nazis. And well, Gosar, also, I mean, Gosar, yeah. I think we can comfortably say yeah. is, an, is, a, is, a, is a white supremacist. Yeah, his with, family told us. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And a white supremacist and, and a fascist. He definitely staffs Nazis, uh, you know, uses Nazi staffers, neo-Nazi staffers, who do have ties to Fuentes and others. And, Wait, you know, they're, they're huge. I mean, this is... This is one of those bigger unreported stories, I think, in American politics, is that there is a growing number of Republicans who not just believe the thing that they're saying that is white supremacist or worse, um, but they employ staff that is young, incredibly engaged with politics, but also unapologetically fascist. And that's, that's a serious problem. Looper you know, is just a new. It's just a new name for Nazi. It's a new form of Nazi. I mean, yeah, the Groip, the Groipers, and and all of that. I mean, these are all just uh, fascist youth movements with different flavors. Yeah. And so I, be, when that story came out, I literally DM'd all these DC reporters. I begged them. I said, I've got a story for you. It's so easy. Here's what you do. Yeah. Wait for this Nazi ghost our staffer, Wade Searle, to go out to lunch on Capitol Hill and just take a picture of the staffers he's going to lunch with. Because I yep. guarantee you this guy knows 20 other or 30 or 50 other fellow Groiper, secret Groipers that work in Congress. They're all buddies. They all go to lunch together. And lo and behold, we know that's true. We have a uh, the great Zach Roberts, who I, who's been on the podcast before. He snapped a photo of Wade yep. Searle and then the not the Groiper Nazi staffer for MTG waiting at uh, on the street uh, in their suit and tie out for lunch. And I told reporters, just take a picture. I'll help you identify them. There is a nest. I have been told, and it's one of those horrifying things that half of the Gen Z Republican staffers in Congress are, are basically Groypers or part of I mean, a basically Nazi cult. You know, I don't have any numbers on it, yeah. but just looking at the amount of people that we know at the congressional level have deep ties to these groups, it doesn't shock me. You know, like, I think that's the scariest part for me is it just doesn't shock me. But these are, you know, these are the stories that journalists have to start to jump into more readily and larger news outlets have to be more comfortable with because these are stories that are important for a lot of reasons and are stories that really capture something fundamental about our country that we have to understand to move forward and move out of this phase of, of backslide. And that's the hardest part, right? Like is it, uh, historically, this is one of those subjects that uh, doesn't make it super far. It hasn't been very telling how the right has been reacting to these people being exposed as like anti-Semites and racists, like the Hockman, the Pedro Gonzalez, the uh, Richard Hiania, the amount of it's like a Mexican standoff. It's like, I better not say anything because uh, I got my own stuff in the group chat. Like, well, they, they have to go. They're really passionate that these guys should not. Should, gotta, they got to have jobs. They got to get paid. They're so invested because they're part of them. Well, right. I mean, it's... You know, it's co-conspirators, right? Like, at the end of the day, these are all people who have a vested interest in not letting things get out because there's more that they don't have not publicly put out. And, you know, there's a this kind of gentleman's agreement level of covering backs is really the thing that we have to break if we want these stories to get out and they need to get out. Let's just talk about this stupid 2024 race. <laughs> it's already over. 
We thought maybe we were going to get something, but right. I mean, this is over, right? It's Trump. I mean, Trump's going to be the Republican candidate, right? Like barring some bizarre, you know, truly world shaping event. I think we all see Trump probably being the, the front runner for the Republicans. And that's going to mean even if he's possibly in custody. I mean, there's just a whole lot here where we're going to see some strange stuff regardless. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't know what these trials look like. We don't know what the outcomes are going to be. But it, it does appear he's going to be the Republican candidate. And, you know, I think talking with friends I have who monitor misinformation and disinformation, some of the stuff, news stories that have come out about, like, Elon's fake followers. There are a whole bunch of shenanigans sitting in the wings for the lead up to 2020. 24 and you know the republicans this is there's very much like if they lose this is done for at least a generation for them they're not going to have access to you can't maintain this level of right-wing quote populist fervor indefinitely you just can't without someone in office so you know i think there's going to be a whole lot more that we haven't seen yet that's going to come from these people because this also, I think, for the wealth class is being seen as a referendum on some other things. <laughs> Control who and what, you know, where the future is going to go. And, you know, there's probably some fear looking at it from, you know, from a more critical perspective. I think there's some fear by the wealth uh, the white wealth class specifically that like between climate change, the, the political and, 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 and you know, uh, generational shift that's taking place, you know, they're, they see it as a, this is our shot. Uh, if we don't win it, this is going to be bad for us. You know, increasingly that's the feeling I get. So, you know, no holds barred, I think, is the words I would use to describe 2024. And I would preface that by saying that 2016, in my view, was a practice run for this one. Well, at least we know that Twitter is going to be a really responsible stakeholder. And <laughs> they're going to be the 10 people on their content moderation team are really going to be putting in that. <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, but, yeah, it's it's going to go super well. I'm sure Elon will unveil some super brilliant AI that works perfectly with zero problems. What what did Linda, the the quote unquote CEO of Twitter, say the other day? She said there was he was just so hilarious. She said there's been a 99 percent or was a 90 percent drop in hates. Bullshit, I believe is the uh, the the technical term for that is bullshit. bullshit. They they literally have have given like the Nazi editor of Stormfront a blue check. Uh, oh yeah, I mean and Anglin Anglin is literally on Twitter with a check mark. Yeah, it's all part of fucking hate speech. But you do you? Well, here's what's scaring me, man. Biden, look, I'm gonna vote for Biden, but he does look like I saw this meeting he had with Herzog, the president of Israel, and he was just sitting there like it was a good. You know, we met, and it's it. It, that is it's that is scary to me especially I mean, because trump has not really aged he really well, trump has a i mean he his reality distortion feels crazy biden i don't like biden i don't i don't like his 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 politics but like we're you know we're in, we're in deep shit here um, the other options bad or I just, the big the big problem is is you know that i see with something like that meeting I mean, it just outlines how we we got to the ger the gerontocracy of our government is part of the issue here. And it's part of what's being exploited against democracy and freedom, ironically. And like, you know, Biden, unfortunately, he may be the only person that can beat Trump. Right. Right. Well, and I, that bothers me. Well, but I wasn't asking about Biden. I think we all know, like the deal with biden you know he's <laughs> yeah he's no, whatever yeah. he's the guy we got and whatever yep. nobody's yeah. okay but can trump win because i am not i i really think he can i really think i can't can. count anything out like I mean, what, what percent trump, would trump's, you put? trump's i can't i can't give you a percentage but he has a shot right like that's yeah. the part that should scare people is he's got a pretty decent shot of getting to a place in these elections where even if he doesn't win he can cause enough chaos that you know 2020 was 
was one thing, but if he knows that he goes to prison, if he loses and it's even remotely close, they're going to go to the electoral college. They're going to go to a Supreme court. They're going to throw everything they can at this to, to tilt it towards Trump. Um, and that gives him a shot, a pretty solid one. And, you know, people want to make some high and, and, and mighty argument that these legal proceedings are somehow going to shut him down. And I have my hopes and dreams that well, it Georgia does. will definitely not happen before the election. New York is really not. A, it's all the only one is this Jack Smith one. Well, in the Jack Smith case is an interesting case. It has some serious ramifications. So even that one going through is going to start to do stuff. But, you know, this there's a real chance that we get to the election and it's it's close by appearance whether or not it is on the ground we you know is hard to know and it just it looks a lot like 2020 and if that's the case and trump still loses again i think all bets are off i think too if he really plays up the cards that he's been playing that are absolutely networked and stochastic violence and he continues targeting people this is going to get very out of hand in pretty uh quick fashion but in a very different way than the out of hand of january 6th i don't think we see another organized effort like that from anything i've you know seen read heard we don't see something that organized and big i feel like we just scratched the surface in a way like we need to i have so many questions for you no i i think i think that's absolutely fair you know i mean that's it's one of the things that i've really run into with all of this you know i put up another article what yesterday yeah yesterday I'm looking at it right now and um you know i had originally written like 1500 words i was like okay this is great this is a nice little primer and then i did my first edit and it was 2000 words and then i did the second edit and it was about 2500 words and you know <laughs> just in it and it's just it's going to be you know all of this is such a massive decades long set of kind of interlocked movements and 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 issues and you know kind of it's there's a whole system now that's being built and that's a lot harder to explain than one member or one aspect and you know the real hard part is a lot of this is a feeling more than anything and that's a hard thing to explain you know and do you want to start? I was just looking at your new article. Do you want to start there? Yeah, we could talk about that. Absolutely. So you wrote this new article on your 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 site called AstroTurf Nation. Yep. What What's it about? What's... So it's actually kind of you know it's it's a little bit in the world we were talking about last time, um, but it's also it's you know it's really kind of starting to. Uh, get into the nitty gritty of the American New Right, their kind of their view of what's going on in the moment and who and, you know, who's leading it and kind of some of the analysis around that. And, you know, I opened the article by saying that the American New Right is a pan right syncretic movement that acts as a franchise for like the larger international new right and the global movement around that. And I mean, that's really how this all started, right? Is, you know, I was watching and reading as much as I could about the Russian, the building of the the Putin state in Russia, let's say. And I did a lot of research around that. And, uh, you know, I think we covered some of that, but that's what this has turned into is this similar pan right appeal and the astroturf you know the the alt-right in years past really understood the power of the astroturf and the power of the feeling again that they were inevitable or that they had these huge numbers and that they had you know the ability to to crash all these polls when in reality they were review bombing or you know poll farming um to to give that appearance and the political environment has adopted that on the the republican side in such a major way that like i i kind of felt we had to jump into that and so i started started writing and ended up with about uh yeah 20 2500 words on why that specific 
uh, vector of the American New Right and their disinformation franchise is extremely dangerous. The uh, graphic design for the article has a picture of Chris Rufo. Why did you why did you pick him? Well, so he, you know, Rufo kind of um, he touches a few of the bases that I really um, would consider to be a constellation uh, that appears a ton in the American New Right. And that constellation is this, you know, so first you have his, I go over late in the article, kind of his life and uh, his uh, work at the Manhattan Institute and, and uh, being a, a domestic policy fellow at the Heritage Foundation, research fellows at a uh, research fellow at the Discovery Institute, which is like a creationist, let's say, uh, institution that, uh, you know, pushes some extremely hard right views that oppose the theory of evolution uh in favor of intelligent design and and some other stuff and he, he also i mean he's worked for the claremont institute as a senior fellow i mean he he's kind of the face of this and he moved from what you know a, a right-wing thinker with the largest air quotes around that that i can muster you know that that turned from that into a culture warrior and lit you know lit the fires of the anti CRT movement and now he's moved into the position that you know he i think has the most damage ability from which is leading ron DeSantis's anti-enlightenment war against higher education and public education in general in florida um so i chose him because he's kind of the you know he he's the face that people um even outside of the terribly brainwormed you know community i'm a part of it would probably recognize and and that's uh still a niche part of the republican party um but it's definitely growing and you know for me he's kind of the, one of the faces that i think really embodies the danger of this entire new right and the infrastructure they're building you know one question I I think it's always good to ask un uncomfortable questions of you know, challenge <laughs> challenge yourself. Yeah. One question I I think I'm I'm going to start asking guests is where do you draw your lines, right? So John Kennedy, the Louisiana senator. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with him. I don't like him, but he's not he's not unacceptable. Like so, who? Where do you draw your line on the right? So, like, people you don't... I'm not saying you agree with them. But mm -hmm. who, who who do you put on that edge? Like, so, Rufo, you, you would say, is unacceptable. Are there any right-wing media figures that you, you're okay with? I mean, at this point, you know, it's... it's um, their information ecosystem is so contaminated with... Everything from standard conspiracy theory to the worst kind of anti-Semitic and uh, racist conspiracy theories. It's hard, you know, my line is probably before that, right? So, like, for me, it's hard because this, the Trump, the, tr the Trump legacy in part is tearing open this hole in the kind of the corpse of the body politic and letting all of this just rot fall out and you know at this point it's hard to say you can you know let's say you know joe kennedy or john kennedy is actually um an interesting choice right like he's a republican um i think a lot of the new you know the new crop of the republican party you know doesn't even notice him in certain ways you know i don't know right now if you can if you can be in the republican party um after what's happened since 2020 and 2021 instead you know in my mind and still be taken in, in good faith so but okay mitt, mitt, mitt romney susan collins are they're <laughs> acceptable right I mean, they're both liars, so I don't know. You know, but, but, like but, for me, that's that's the thing. Like, if we need honesty, right? Like to counter the thing that that Trump has done to politics and to just our social understanding of truth, you know, we're going to need people who are quote good Republicans, and I don't know if that exists anymore 
to like the good Republicans are going to have to be the ones that say this is this is this is the worst thing possible. Right. And this is dangerous and it's unacceptable. And we've said this now, you know, I, <laughs> I've probably said this now for eight years. Right. Like that's the thing it's going to take. I just don't think we're going to see it. I, I think the Republican Party, as we know it, previous to 2010 is dead. Yeah. I think oh, that yeah. is I, I think that's a story oh, yeah. that, you know, any belief that we're coming back to rationality from these people. Yeah. I don't think that's happening. So I think, you know, it's hard right now to see who you could say, you know, this is, this is, uh, you know, acceptable. Well, like, I, have a, like, I, you know, it's one of those guilt by association things for me, right? Like, you know, this is, we're right at the edge of some very heavy stuff to be a part of. I'm trying to imagine what a healthy right <laughs> would look like. And I don't know what it would be. And I'm wondering, uh, have you thought about that at all? I mean, I'm 36, right? I've never in my life seen a healthy Republican Party. <laughs> so I, I don't know. You know, like when I was in my, like, you know, by the time I was 10, we were, the country was dealing with, with, with Newt Gingrich and the full frontal, you know, beginning of this um, in the, in the way that we understand now. And so I don't know, you know, I don't know what a truly healthy Republican Party or conservative movement would look like. Um, because if we look further back at historical examples, we get people who sound so much further left than the Republican Party has been since before I was alive that I, I don't I just don't I don't know what people would do. <laughs> you know, it's one of those ones where it's just we don't have a frame of reference for that if we're less than 50, <laughs> you know, like I, 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 sometimes I look at Canada and I, I think, well, maybe that, you know, because it's like, it's like, I, I think to myself, there's always going to be people who are more conservative, right. And, and people yeah, are more well, and liberal. And so that's we, the balance, right? Like that's the balance of democracy is figuring out. We all have to have that, that the conversation that your, your question begs, right? Like what is, if we want that party to survive and not become a modern version of the Whigs, which is how I actually see the Republican party right now, you know, if we don't want that outcome, I, I don't know how we rein this back in in the current environment and when the current monetary feedback seems to, to feed this just populist out, outrage and, and conspiracy theory. And, you know, that's uh, throughout a lot of the conservative movements worldwide now. You know, um, that's yeah. the bigger issue, right? Like this is conservatism inherently seems to have been able to been not able to to withstand the full might of digital modernity so it had to figure out you know a way to deal with that which is to weaponize it against modernity yeah right? I... like that that's one of the hardest parts about this movement right like and about this ideology is like it's just weaponizing high tech against everything including itself um yeah, it, it it was so clear to me in like 2015, even before Trump, that what passed as conservatism, whatever, was really just a total paper tiger. Yeah, total, yeah they, absolutely. That, the base had no interest in like cutting, so you know, the cutting the taxes, and it was really it. They had left this huge void for Trump, and. <laughs> It's embarrassing because I was so ignorant, but I thought I, you know, I thought maybe I thought maybe I didn't think Trump would be good at all. But back in the beginning, I thought, oh, maybe a more populist uh, Republican Party that says is more skeptical of free trade and less and doesn't want to cut Social Security. Yeah, it's OK. And then it clearly it, it became the worst nightmare that everybody predicted. I, all the predictions about him unleashing Pandora's box as far as hatred, it all came true to the point where oh, yeah. he, he's I, now yeah. I now view Trump as a, and I wonder what you think. I view him now as almost a moderate in his move. Well, I, I think Trump, we don't know. I mean, Trump, Trump's a, 
a figurehead in a lot of ways. So he's an empty vessel, right? We don't actually know what Trump thinks on anything because he says seven different things. And that's, I think, the danger of Trump, right? In certain ways is that it allows people to make assumptions. And, you know, I don't, we don't know what Trump's uh, heart on heart is. Everything I've seen would say he is a, you know, ra rapidly radicalizing along with others in the party towards something that, like, this country has no conception of. He was already an authoritarian right-wing white supremacist, right? Like, that was clear. But he was an incompetent fascist. And now, you know, it sure appears that from what he said and how they are orchestrating the media coverage i mean they're uh, pulling out all the stops on him not being an incompetent fascist or he's hired more competent fascists behind him you know i think there's a misunderstanding now that's similar to 2016 in that people assume there are going to be guardrails from some of the institutional stuff like uh the courts right now and that is a i i hope it th those guardrails work to preclude him from taking office but with a guy like trump and a movement like the one he's built and that is assembled around him he, he's going to be a very scary guy here for a minute in a way that he just couldn't be even with the full might of the white house and he was horrifying as president so i have some real fear that we're going to find out exactly who trump is in short order actually do you think he can win, or what do you? What would you pay his chances for his fight? I can't. You know, I I'm not going to yeah, give a percentage, right. but but I do think there's absolutely a chance that yep he 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 could seize power again. Just because Biden looks so old, I, I, you know, I I don't actually buy into that. I think Biden is not the president I would want. I'm just saying the perception, whether oh, it's, yeah. it's the, the, scary. The, yeah. the, the, it's weird how well the media has warped this perception. And he is old, right? I, he's an octogenarian, and, and I, I am not a big Biden fan, uh, as anyone who follows me on. I, I'm just saying, like, the way he yeah. walks, you know what I mean? Well, like, I mean, I think there's a perception, right? Trump's not much younger than him. I, I, you know, that, I think, is the least effective argument for either of these guys i think the issues with biden especially for people you know our age younger are really important issues and ones that honestly like it's it's really it's absurd that he hasn't followed up on that's a danger to him he's going to need all hands on deck to win an election against trump i have a feeling and alienating kids is not going to be helpful. With that being said, you know, Trump Trump is is a guy who I just I don't think anyone should underestimate the machinery behind it right now. And he's proven willing, you know, he's more than willing to to go as hard as he needs to to do what he wants. And I think that's the thing that just keeps sitting in the back of my mind is not that we're going to get another January 6th, because I don't think we're going to get one of those, but more that this is just such a radicalizing moment for so many people on the right, that we're just going to be dealing with an outflow from him, even just doing what he's done so far in so far as the, ele you know, the, um, the election interference case um, in Georgia. Like, he, he's turning up the gas fast and i don't you know the best forecast for the politics is that it gets very scary i think and there's a chance that he does win legally even i think there's a chance that he tries to steal it a second time <laughs> you know I, I i think everything's on the table is what i'm trying to say you wrote about one of uh i consider top three creepiest people i in america in one of your other articles and i forgot to bring him up uh, i call him red beard charles johnson oh chuck oh chuck. There, there's few i don't even know what to say but he just gives me the creeps um i mean he's again the, the, the he i i you know he's a he is a true spooky guy 
And, you know, he's a dangerous guy because he's very adept at uh, manipulating people online into believing really, really outlandish things about himself and others in an effort to both rehab himself, but also spread, you know, the same kind of uh, new right white nationalist extremist material. And yeah, Chuck's a scary guy. Carl, did I have I did, have I told you about I was in a Twitter space. I was listening to a Twitter space he he was doing and he literally said the first memo that President Biden read in the Oval Office was uh was his memo. Was Chuck's. Yeah, he said, "Yep." I mean, I that doesn't shock that doesn't shock me, right? Like that that this is the you know, I, I spoke about I, last time we talked and then I've written, you know, the last couple of pieces I've put up are about this infrastructure building, right? And part of the infrastructure of the new right is stuff like Chuck Johnson being the guy to write memos, if that's true. No, that's not true. I, I, I'm i sure he's like a... He, well, he's, he's a, a liar. liar. Well, he's a serial liar. He's yeah. a pathological. But, but that's what I'm saying. Like, it's, it's all about the thing, though it's that perception right and that's why the lie is important to a guy like chuck because if people believe that that's the truth that's where this it's the feeling it's the uh, the truthiness it's the whatever we want to call it like that is the new right and that's why chuck is dangerous right like is because of things like that and then also the infrastructure building they have done where they have been in the the White House with guys like Trump and others doing exactly that. First memos, different memos. You know, I mean, it's 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 um, it's all the ruse, the 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 lie, the 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 whatever, the fear mongering, however you want to put that, is all part of the same thing as the actual memo, right? Like they're all the same power to these people. It's all <laughs> Charles Johnson. He really illustrates uh, your point that we discussed last time about these right wing creeps in uh, connected to all this tech money. He's very, well, that, yeah. he's very yeah. close friends with uh, Palmer Lucky, the guy who did Oculus, the VR company, the Facebook Paul, and and built the the one off a killer VR headset. That one. Yeah, and and now he has a defense contractor uh, firm called Andrew Andrill or something, and they get tons of Pentagon money, and the guy's hanging out with this, you know, crazy anti-Semite Charles Johnson, Matt Gates. We have a tech uh, creep problem. You know what's what's amazing? The, te the techno fascist creep is happening in real time, if you will. It's a creep, and they're creepy, too. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. In fact, it works both ways. It's it, kind of nice, it, nice how that works. It, it's very sad to me that people were talking about defund the police and all that, which is fine, but that we couldn't even get the police departments to stop using the AI company that uh, <laughs> Charles Johnson co-owns. Well, I mean, that's just it, though, right? Like, this is the infrastructure building, again, of the new right, is that clear kind view. of integration. It, yeah, clear view. Yeah, it's that kind of integration, though, right? It's the merger of tech and the state. State repression. State state violence, right? So, like, it's all these different things that, like, they start merging together, and that's, like, ultimately part of the goal, right? Like, is not just to shift the opportunity, not just to shift politics, but to become too big to fail as an ideology because it's integrated into the systems that are already in place within our society. And that's the part for me that like Clearview, uh, Palantir, all these different companies that, you know, rightly so have been called out for years, whether they're Theals, whether they're, you know, whoever's that we understand as part of this Clearview. They're just, it's, it's being integrated into every level of our society, right? Like SpaceX, you know, as has been reported this week, uh, and Musk, you know, they they have pretty much more power to do certain things than the U.S. military. So the military defers to them. You know, we, we're seeing it again with social media, where now because Musk had radicalization and recruitment machine and a terror machine for these people, that, you know, they're 
uh, Meta and Instagram and all these other platforms are going to stop moderating conspiracy theories and misinformation. Like, this is, you know, when people talk about, myself included, like tech accelerationism, this is it, right? Like, this is the integration with co-option and dismantling of, like, critical parts of not just government, but how we understand society. What what's the deal with the stupid uh, thing they're all putting in their Twitter names? The E slash A C C E slash A C C. What does that mean? It, that is an accelerationist. That's you know. I mean, this is. Uh, so what's that, the E? What's the E? It, that would be effective uh, accelerationism, right? So oh, they're like, they're they're calling effective. Like effective ultralists. These are these. So like this is literally Nick Land, the Dark Enlightenment, the neo reactionary guys I talked about last time. This is that at, at full speed. And like when their uh, when their stated thing is capitalism can be viewed as a form of intelligence that optimizes resources allocation in a competitive environment. EACC advocates for embracing and accelerating the natural dynamism of the universe rather than attempting to slow it down and control it. That is, you know, techno babble for we're going to turn, we're going to disrupt everything. And that's, you know, I mean, that's, I think last week when we talked, I, I talked about how the neo reactionary idea was to sharpen capitalism to a fascist point. Well, EACC is that very, you know, very thinly veiled behind this techno babble, VC babble. How from, can it, from. how can, how can it be bad if uh, the likes of Martin <laughs> Shkreli are behind it? When you have such moral leaders. Um... Yes, such moral. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, it's, he it's one of, every one of the worst people you can think of that from the last few years in tech, I am sure you can find them in one of the spheres of this, the EACC side, the test reel side, you know, it's, these are the ones that are coming to, the fact they're coming to light publicly, like in itself says that there's already been an acceleration that's pretty profound. And that's scary as hell. See, no. what's the deal with these guys, these, um, what should I call the Nick Land people? What's a good? I mean, those are neo reaction. Neo reaction. What's yeah. the What's the deal with them all and or a lot of them ending up in China? Like, so Nick Land lives in China now. Well, yeah. So that's a that's actually you know a good question. I don't have a great answer for it actually. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, but aren't there some others? Uh, I'm well, blanking. I think it's. I think it's I think it's partially there you know I there's because there's this monarchist element right to 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 the neo reactionary uh, movement and by element I mean it's a huge part of their thinking but because of that um there's some weird there is a weird fixation with city states and it's they racist it, 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 well and I was going to say but it's this weird racist it's 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 the it's the fusion of these weird racist ideals around and, and then fusing it into some bizarre form of monarchism, right? And so I, I would assume, you know, that has something to do with this. I, I I can't say for sure. I just don't know enough about you know why. But you know, I I I would I would I would not hesitate to hazard that as a guess. So so let's do. Let me just do some mapping on my own. So the, in this neo-reactionary group, um, it's Nick Land, it, and tell me if I'm wrong, I probably am. It's Curtis Yarvin, it's, and then it's also the Bronze Age pervert. Well, you have like Boston, and you have like Nick Boston, Boston and these guys, okay. yeah, Land, all these guys, right? Yeah. Bronze but but is BAP or what? Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I I would put him in that camp, right? Like, I I think I think you could definitely put him in that camp. Yeah. Um, somewhere. I mean, it's hard again to pin some of these people down just because, like, they they do have uh, kind of the Venn diagram of ideologies and different beliefs that they have publicly stated at different times. But you know, like a lot of this, you know, there there's so much where. It looks and sounds similar, but because of a niche feature that one doesn't have, 
it's not the same thing if that makes sense it's more what they you know a lot of these movements don't have that um shows how they're different than what they do have and i think all of these guys have interlocking you know they're interlocking views that make it appear you know that they 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 may hold three or four views at once not contradictory necessarily but you know from different places in their you know in the thinking but yeah that i would put in that camp yeah I, do you i don't even understand I, uh, BAP. I'm just too lazy. I mean, I always remember is <laughs> that's been. I mean, you're 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 doing it the right way. I you know I know cursory stuff about BAP purely because of just you know when you're watching and, and kind of waiting around it, it that account shows up. All you know? I know all I know is he posted pictures of like bodybuilders and it, and then he would post like tweets that would be like. The Avorian twins are developing a hegemonic oh, rule. Oh, or, like, yeah. It's like, I'm like, what the, what the hell am I reading? What is that? I mean, you know, some of this stuff is, is there's a level of D and D to, to this, to the, to the new right and to the neo reactionary side that just is so cringy and just terrible where it's like that kind of thing. And that's why, you know, in, in a lot of cases, I just, <laughs> I do a lot of the, 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 you know, the research I do, I have uh, reading, you know, like I have tons of books and um, articles and different news sources that I check. Twitter generally is the place I go to look, stare, and then realize I need bleach for everything my computer's touched because I was dealing with these people, you know, so it's hard, you know, BAP is important, but also it's not it's part of the larger influence network for these people so who who's i'm i'm going to ask you the tough questions now the, the just rap, i'm going to challenge you so who is who's more influential uh, and this is obviously this is a neutral <laughs> question it's not about who's oh, yeah, no, no, it's, it's not okay. about who's good or bad it's about is it the groipers or the neo reactionaries oh jeez jesus christ um well i think i think the neo-reactionaries for sure are more powerful because they are guys who have multiple billions in venture capital right, right like, so peter Thiel. so who are the billionaires that you feel confident are part of it so peter Thiel. oh Thiel for sure okay. um andres mark andreessen for sure okay because, you know, he's out there with his BS. And then, I mean, there are a lot of people that, you know, I, I you know, I think I think we could put Musk in that camp pretty clearly now. He definitely is clicking all of the boxes. And I actually have been really, the last couple of days, I've been really, I have a sneaking suspicion that what we're seeing from Musk and what we're seeing from Vivek Ramswamy is a, a, a window into what american republican and right-wing politics will look like for the 2028 cycle because it's going to be someone like vivek who's got the mckinsey energy and is a radical new writer as he is you know it came out today i believe or yes no it's today that you know vivek was a, a fan is a fan of uh Hanina's and Oh yeah, they they yeah they did a podcast together and yeah, yeah and they've and they've and they've yeah they've read a ton of each other you know there's there's a there's a whole bunch of play here so I think you know I think Musk for sure like I said uh, we could I think very easily put him in that camp now along with like I said Mark Andreessen you know Thiel there are definitely some others that definitely aren't as and, and let me just do devil's advocate. So, like, some of these E, A, I mean, maybe you're totally right, but the, some of these E slash ACC, whatever, the guys on Twitter, I, I presume they would say this is just about um, AI and, like, AI, this debate about AI safety and doomerism. And, well, this and, all, yeah, and I was going to say, they, I mean, this all grows out of, yeah. Sorry, they would sorry. say it has nothing to do with, you know, democracy or monarchy or any of that, you know, dark enlightenment stuff. Well, and I think it's the same way that if you ask, 
you know, in 2015, if you would ask Richard Spencer if he was an admirer of, of, of fascism, right? He would have he would have lied through his teeth. I think there's a similar thing going on here because when you really do look at what these groups and 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 philosophical you know kind of conversations they're trying to have are are implying, these these at their heart are you know I mean, white supremacist eugenics just deeply scientific racist you know it, it's the worst kind of applications of technology imaginable and you know with the long termers as an example like you telling me that that a future potential life is more important than a hundred million or a billion lives now because of climate change and then your your second comment on that statement is we also have to have more kids so we can repopulate the planet. We're starting to get into a world that is only known, you know, I mean, those are, those are deeply problematic and, 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 uh, you know, fascist aligned, uh, Nazi aligned, white supremacist aligned ideologies. Right. So like, I think it's hard to make the claim if you're one of these people to say, Oh, well, it's not about that when it's like, it clearly is. Because your spokespeople have said as much. It might be cloaked in the same kind of techno speak that you've tried to like use and have used effectively to manipulate business and society for the last 20 years. But on this one, it seems not to be working. So just for the, in the just for the audience, yeah. um, what are the main bullet points? If it's like two or three bullet points of Yarvin, what are they? I mean, similar to, I mean, to Nick Land, right? He, 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 okay, the big difference, I would say, and this is the difference, right? Is uh, Curtis Yarvin has gone on to kind of thrive in Silicon Valley. Whereas, like you said, Land, you know, is out. Um, but like Moldbug, his alias online you know was really influential in a way that even nick land stuff in some ways wasn't but like yarvin uh i think the other point i would make is he is incredibly open about wanting to end democracy he is as open as you can be and he is a huge you know i mean this is someone that blake masters has cited jd bank and sites i mean you know he's incredibly influential in the new republican and new american right you know and like that was i think that was in 2021 when jd vance you know was was kind of linked openly but you know i mean what did they he, want to replace it with a monarch like how is is this for real like well i mean he 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 thinks that a napoleon or a lenin should seize should seize quote absolute power a napoleon or a lenin so he doesn't even care what the no, ideology these, these, no no these people that's what you know i think it needs to be impressed upon people there is this is hollow as hell beyond wanting the absolute power of the monarchy and the hierarchy and that structure and that rigidity and that absolute power he so he he doesn't care if it if it's a communist leader he he you know it appears not from what he's said right and i mean you have to understand like his entire goal stated is absolute power and his idea his view is he and the others in his, his you know that think his way have to do everything in their power to make that happen and you know centralizing power like this you know the, the, he's a monarch <laughs> you know like and you know he's dead serious about it and you know, I mean, these guys, these guys are getting bigger and bigger, and you know, they're getting more and more gravity around them. They're gaining mass. And it's, it's, you know, these are the ideologies that float with the more white nationalist ones, right? In the, the, the kind of milieu of the new American right. And that's the real, I mean, this is that we're getting right into the core of the thing. Does he, does he propose like practical, does he like say like, I'm hoping that Senator Vance will put forward the monarchy bill in 2030 or something. I mean, like, or is it just, is it theoretical? No, no, it's, it's accelerationist, right? Like his goal is to ready the field so they can seize absolute power. That's his goal. That, that is his stated goal, right? Like is to create conditions in which he and his friends 
in the new right can collapse democracy and seize power. That is their stated goal, right? Like they say monarchist and all of this. They're saying under one leader, they're, they're calling for a dictatorship. And, you know, I mean, they're talking about the dictatorship of capital, right? A businessman at the top, essentially, and the whole thing run as a corporation where the people are ground to dust as uh, capitalism is, quote, sharpened to a fascist point. In 2002, Yarvin founded Urb. How do you say this? Urbit? Computer? Urbit, yep, yep, yep. Yeah. As a decentralized network of personal servers. In 2013, uh, he, so he's wait, is this a did he ever is he still working on it? Wait, did, does anybody use this thing? Is this a real thing or what? What is it going well, on? Well, he's 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 in all these little pies, you know, like all of them. He's got fingers in, in everything from AI to decentralization to uh, you know, just fingers in everything, and like you know. It, Yarvin, these these guys are the dark enlightenment, and they call themselves that, right? Like, they they know what they are. They're a counter enlightenment, and that's what they want to be, right? So, like, that's how you have to look at their politics. And you know, you've got you've got stuff like you know, you've got magazines and different things running huge exposés on this guy, and and you know, they, they'll either kind of gliss over the fact that he's a you know staunch uber right wing you know monarchist and oh he's a philosopher he has these weird ideas and it's like he thinks of his ideas as you know as a way to like poison the world in a certain way uh when you read some of his writing like he wants to spread his ideas so it's it's scary seeing all of this happening kind of at the same time understanding that their goals are all interlinked um, they might not have the same view of why in like the ethno-nationalist sense or in a religious sense, but they all have, you know, them, the, uh, the, 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 the Christian right, all these different groups have overlapping goals of ending the American democracy we understand and replacing it with something far, far worse. And so that's where, you know, you start to see causal chains from someone like Yarvin, and you see where that starts to bleed into circles that were maybe much more Christian, you know, mil millennial apocalyptic instead. So they've started to all, you know, stuff starting to kind of pollinate in really heavy ways because these guys are getting out further and further. And so like Yarvin, my point would be just, just don't listen to a guy. <laughs> I, I'm looking at his Wikipedia right now, and it says investor. I can't say this guy's name. Balaji Sirabasan has okay. also, has also echoed Yarvin's ideas of techno corporate and is this a real world word realism? Camaralism. Yes. Yeah. 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 Camaralism. Yes. Yeah. So so okay. so like that's that by so so unicameral bicameral right so like the unicameral you know the, the the this is all talking about hierarchy right and the way that our and, and like the hierarchy of society should function and yeah it says he advocated in a 2013 speech a society quote society run by silicon valley an opt-in society ultimately outside the U.S. run by technology. Yeah, this reminds me of that old that whole seasteading thing, which they. Well, this is this is seasteading for the internet, but this the the worst part is this is actually caught on, and that seasteading has actually turned into a digital nation state, right? But this authoritarian as hell, extremely hard right monarchist digital nation state and it's starting to look for physical real estate and that's that's the danger right like we're looking at a digital movement that's decentralized believes in mo monarchical single party rule and fanatical use of technology to both maintain and end life like uh to quote optimize the world system end quote Right, like that. These people, I call it techno fascism for a reason, and and I've faced some flack for that. But like, 
that's the easier way to understand this right like we are deep into an ideological swamp but like this is you know this is the future of the movement and it's not they, some box of power do they have a sci-fi novel that they love sort of like um ayn rand's like atlas shrugged i i i haven't read snow crash yet but i i this seems like a movement where like well, there's, it's it, like, you know, Nick Land, all these guys came out of the cybernetic okay. research unit at Warwick. And, like, that's a philosophy department in their own little club, right? And, yeah, I mean, there's uh, there's something to it. Yar Yarvin's not, he's not a neo, he's not a Nazi, right? He's he's some kind of fascist, right? The, these, these guys, I, you know, they say they're monarchists and neo-reactionaries. I take them at their word but i also you know the way that i understand fascism right and the way that um mm -hmm. fascism functions it sounds and looks and feels identical to this idea of neo-reaction or monarchism right. or yeah. you know that you know when someone tries to tell me that well our only goal is to to um end democracy and democracy for a hyper capitalist authoritarian right wing state in my mind we know of a couple of those historically and one of them murdered hundreds of millions mm. of people yeah. and exterminated people in camps and yeah. one ended yeah. with their leader being hung by the population yeah, I, I I'm not saying he's good or he isn't a fascist. No, no, I'm just and I, and no, he's no, not no. a he's not like a he's. I think he's ethnically the, the, Jewish. So he's not. They're not saying they're not these. They're not. Okay. They are. They are not going to be swastika toting. Okay. You know, this is this is the button down, right? Like this they're is fancy. The, I'm gonna, or, well, or they're just like I'm going to wear my t-shirt, my flip flops, and my black mm. jeans, and we're going to talk about rationalist reasoning behind why we should allow people to die now to secure a better future for our hypothetical progeny and that's just repackaged fucking you know 14 words propaganda and you know that's that's where it's at did you read fire and fury by michael wolf by any chance i did not okay i thought it was the best trump book it was very easy to read um but it, basically like half of the book is just ba bannon at these dinner parties just like <laughs> spilling the, spilling the beans yeah very telling funny. yeah yeah telling and, the world what they plan to do well and but he the way he talks about peter Thiel, he says peter Thiel like showed up to trump tower with his army of right-wing twinks or something and i i'm not i'm not saying the, i'm not this is not about his sexuality at all, but it seems like the guy just collects. Like, if you're like a young right winger and you have the fortune of like running into him and he likes you, like he'll he'll just make people for life, you know? Uh, well, I think, I mean, that's, I think that's a billionaire thing in a yeah. certain way. But he, the, he excels at that. Feel, I mean, I, all of these people, right are at some level and this is again just an outward appearances thing just kind of accruers right like they yeah. like accruing things they like holding on to stuff they like having things having either the uh, the, the power those things represent the power they hold the, the the power over a person i mean that just seems to be a running theme right like that seems to be the the, the thing with with him uh, specifically but i think similarly with musk we see it in his uh well but <laughs> really bizarre fan interactions but musk so like peter teal collects like blake masters and JD right exactly yeah yeah and musk, is, and, and musk and is out does here her yeah and, exactly cat and to ian miles chong yeah and oh god, god. uh what that that Terrible, terrible person. He, Ian has had me blocked for three years. <laughs> three years. And every once in a while, someone will send me a screen cap. Like, he just reshared that tweet from three years ago. And it's just like, man, to have so, that much free time. So, let me, let's end on a broad question. Shoot. 
What do you think the conventional wisdom is getting wrong or doesn't understand? I we talked last time about we both agreed that the, the people, the journalists, they don't really get how much more extreme Gen Z right is. <laughs> and and a good example is Nate Hockman and uh, and Richard Hania because Hania, however you say his name. He had he he had enough like shame, I guess, to like do it under a fake name. Hulk and did Why? it did it in public, you know, like with his. Yeah. Mom. The question is, what is the conventional wisdom getting wrong, in your opinion? It could be anything. I mean, I think generally the conventional wisdom, I think, is getting wrong. A couple things that kind of fold into each other, and they are that like that Trump is going to just kind of. Yeah, it, not just Trump, but Trump and the movement, right? Like the MAGA movement are just going to disappear if he somehow goes to jail, which I just don't know the logistics of putting a president in jail. I'm not saying like that, that they, they won't. I just I don't know how you actually physically put a president in a prison. That's one thing. But the, 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 that movement isn't going anywhere. If anything, it's getting more radical. It's getting more able to infiltrate larger swaths of our social fabric which is a huge problem especially at the school board and library board and kind of that level of grassroots uh interaction but you know more broadly than just maga like more broadly the new right is continuing to accelerate and push new goals that we're seeing all the time, the, the, the hysteria around AI, all these different things, you know, these are being driven by these, these same groups of people and individuals. So, you know, I think the, the takeaways I would, I would fold together are the Trump and that are not going anywhere for the foreseeable future. And the broader new right, the American new right is, is really, I mean, it's starting to, to gain some real mass. Yeah, I mean, do you think one question I've asked guests before is the problem with what me and you do a lot is is uh there's not great polling, right? I mean, like you can't it's obviously it's hard to like call people up and be like, "Are you racist? Are you anti-semitic? Are you homophobic?" Like people lie. So well, become... and they lie on basic polling now. So, and yeah. the polling is outrageously bad now. So, so I, well, I become interested in this idea of proxy polling, basically using tricking people into sort of telling. And, and one idea I've talked with somebody at Think Tank about potentially doing it is uh, just to do a generic American history poll. And so, like, the first, oh, like, Eight out of ten questions are like totally uh, fake. I mean, just are just a, a ruse to get the person convinced that they can let their guard down. But you make like the seventh question, uh, and it, you just ask Gen Z Republicans in a poll, and you make the seventh question: Should America have entered World War II? And like, no, I think I think this is the thing though. Like, I think proxy polling and stuff like what you're describing that might be a better way to get the polls. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. and I think actually you could do do that pretty pretty effectively, uh, especially if you understand how to target like advertise you know advertising or promotions to certain age groups because that's what just you know we're missing something in the political sphere publicly and it might be an intentional missing of the point because that requires nuance that requires more depth that requires more reporters that requires more money i you know i can't say which one it is it sure feels like uh there's an intentional push to not maybe go as in depth on some of this exact thing that kind of polling but i would be really interested to see what those numbers reflect because the the gen z population of online republicans is i mean that the those are those are scary 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 extremist visions that these kids have i know and this is the difficulty and I'm sure you've thought about this. And if you have any ideas on on what you would poll if you could that population, but like 
people always will say to people like us, like, uh, oh, that's just a few people on the internet. Oh, it's just a few, which I think is a stupid argument because like the number, any influential political group is always a small minority, right? Well, you, you I mean, the, it's, we, it's like saying you don't have a temperature without taking your thermometer. Yeah. Or to, you know, or, you know, you you you're not taking your temperature without a thermometer, and just assuming, right? And then going from that to not do other things that you might need to, and like it's it's really tough, right? Because we, I think there is a lot of self denial in this country, and that we've all seen over the last number of years since Trump was elected. That like and before that, this country has some huge systemic issues that are feeding the 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 populist hard extremely hard right fascist view that a lot of these kids hold and that's uh, that's the issue right like these are all interconnected issues and the big ones are are our history right like we ourselves have to address our history we have to address the stories we've told ourselves and the myths we've built and uh, built and really have the hard huge conversation that has to be had to really neuter what this next gener generation of republicans is yeah i i mean i understand it i people don't want to look at these you know nazis because no it's, it's disgusting uh, <laughs> but but they're in for they're in for rude awakening and i god i really hope uh, we get follow-up reporting on the Gen Z congressional staffers. Um, oh, that one I do it. too. No, we have to because we have to know what's going on here. And there's enough smoke in the research circles and with the reporting we've already had that like there's a big fire somewhere inside of that. Uh, Carl, story. if I, I if I was in D.C., I would have already broken the story. It's like I told you, you just go there. It, <laughs> it's literally... All you have to do is wait for the Wade Searle, the Nazi staffer, to go to lunch. See, See who he's going to lunch. Yeah. They, I, there is, he knows there's like 30 Groypers there. They all know each other. It's, I guarantee. Yeah. Yeah. But, but this polling thing, we need something. Uh, we need some kind of data because obviously like the traditional polling, like, are you racist? It's just useless. So we're, we're going to need to, uh, and I'd love to hear any ideas you come up with. It's something we need uh, that needs to be done, I think. Yeah, people, I mean, it's something that, that definitely needs to be thought through, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these, these Yar, this Yarvinga, this whole movement, it, it is sort of beyond belief. It's so It's, it's so one of crazy. the ones, yeah. for a long time, like, I do a lot of kind of fact-checking stuff. And, you know, for a long time, I kind of had set aside some of the, the connections because it just sounded too crazy. And then you start reading and it's like, oh, there are 10 articles from four different really well-respected, you know, uh, news outlets that are all saying the same thing. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, and it's it's so it does. But this is one of the biggest, you know, this is going to be one of the bigger changes in how we have to understand politics, I think. Uh, that's happened in the last probably 50 years. Yep, it's the rich nerd fascism. Yep. Revenge of the nerds uh, <laughs> was, was, was a threat, I think. You can read Carl Folk's essays at instituteofunreality.com.